November 10th meeting of the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee. I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded. And after court opens the Concord School Committee, we'll have a roll call. And I'd like to open the Concord Public School School Committee meeting and call it to order. And so Alexa will do the roll call. No, nope, you're on mute. You're still muted. <laughs> Anderson present. I, I will be a master at Zoom by the time we don't need it. Right. Booth present. About present. Ms. Dad present. Mustafi present. Rainy present. Wilson present. And I'd like to um, entertain a motion to adjourn into executive session. Uh, so I'll make a, oh, let's, go ahead, Heather. Would that help? I'll just make a motion that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees uh, move into executive session, uh, sorry, enter into executive session under purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and to return to open session at 5.30 p.m. Second for both. Anderson, aye. And Booth, aye for both. About aye for both. Miss that, aye for both. Eva? Um, I think we've lost Eva's connection. Yeah. I think she went in the breakout room. Well, oh, okay. She may have joined already. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. All there. Unanimous, at least. Do we finish the roll call? I guess so. Good evening, Paul. How are you? What we're going to do is ask uh, non presenters to turn off your cameras. And then if you wish to speak, uh, we're going to recognize you and ask you to turn on your camera. Uh, this way, the school committee can focus on the presenters as they arrive. So thank you for that. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the November 10th uh, region, Concord Carlisle Regional and Concord Public Schools School Committee meeting. Uh, I'd like to take some time for public comments. Should we have any? So for this, if you are on screen and raise your hand, we'll notice. Otherwise, you can go to the participant list and uh, uh, raise your hand. You'll see a, uh, uh, a link to click for that purpose. And just a reminder that if you weren't with us at 5 o'clock when we first opened, this meeting is being recorded. So, Sarah, I don't see I don't any. any hands raised. No. Okay. So, back we move on to reading of the minutes. Anyone like to make a motion um, to accept the joint meeting workshop minutes from August 5th and October 13th? So moved for both committees. Second for both. <laughs> Roll call. Anderson, I for both. 
Who's the eye for both? Proud eye for both. For region. Mm. Is Dave with us? Yes. Rainy, I didn't hear. Uh, Rainy, I for both. Wilson for region. Thank you. Um, and I haven't heard from anybody other than court. Court had some reports, and I didn't hear from anyone else if we had any. But uh, court, if you'd like to start, and then if anyone has some reports to add, that would be great. Briefly, and uh, Dr. Hunter or other committee members may have more on these topics. Uh, one is the select board meeting of last night uh, brought in the superintendent of Minuteman uh, Vocational Technical and a spending item for fields uh, with the unusual proviso that uh, if I'm correct, the select board can uh, approve funding and can, but it's not required, put it on town meeting to deny said funding. It's an odd backwards sort of uh, provision. Is that the way others heard it, Lori or uh, Alexa? That's what I heard, but I did also hear that the, the board was not entirely comfortable with making that decision last night. Correct, so it's back on for next week. The one little detail I thought was interesting, um, I would like to get go look at their proposals, but he said a conservative estimate for a revenue was between three hundred and fifty and four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. And this would be revenue generating capacity of a field with lights. Uh, three fields and lights or three. But no right. tennis courts. Mm -hmm. And also did include a track. Uh, secondly, the uh, Concord's uh, uh, audit committee uh, met this morning. Uh, Jared and Ian and I were there, and uh, uh, the uh, the memo that comes out of the auditor. I had a few recommendations uh, some months ago, all of which have been satisfied uh, by Jared and his team. Jared, anything else on that? Okay. Yeah, it was brief meeting. Uh, and then finally, uh, we've all heard that uh, uh, METCO is going to host a uh, uh, Raise Our Voices for Racial Equality session, uh, an online session, uh, December 11 at 4 o'clock, and we are all invited. And I believe it's a community invite as well. That's what I have, Sarah. Great. Anybody else? Hey, Sarah, this is Eva Mostafi. I'm calling in today. Um, yep. I should be online shortly. I uh, just wanted to um, uh, update uh, October 29th. There was a special education uh, uh, back to school night, uh, well attended. Um, uh, a lot of communication uh, uh, going out, and I'm uh, sure uh, we'll get more uh, from uh, possibly from our, uh, uh, our superintendent, uh, but a lot of information, uh, useful information going to families and an opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge, I think all of our participants, we have a very packed agenda with wonderful presentations um, and and updates and all this coming our way. I think um, everyone who's who's speaking is is now here. So I just want to take a minute to welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. We look forward to everything that you have to share. Um, and we'll finish up our little business and then get on to the good stuff. Um, for correspondence, I don't have, um, I got one correspondence from another school committee member from another district, uh, just some questions, nothing really particular, just how we do things. Um, and and that's that was it, it was a quiet. And for CPS, nothing to report. Great. And so, so I think with that, we can welcome our student. Uh, so first, first we'll go to Amy and Linda yeah. for the the high school, and then we'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Namichi, I believe. 
Uh, before we do that, well, some in between those two, we have a Concord Education oh, Fund. Forgive me, right? You are. I'm sorry. It's all right. So, Linda, Amy and Amy? Linda, yeah, they're here. We, if they start talking, they'll pop up. Hi. On. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Um, Amy, do you want to start and I can just tag along? Yes. Yeah, so the first thing we want to talk about, I guess we had some sports things. Like Lynn, Lynn do you want to do a sports? Oh yeah. Um, so for sports, the DCL finals, just because we couldn't have a normal playoff season ending, um, DCL finals were this past week and girls soccer, unfortunately lost to Westford Academy, but boys soccer won against Lincoln Sudbury, as well as um, CC Field Hockey, who also played Lincoln Sudbury, and they won. So now they're both DCL champions. And I believe cross country also had a race that went pretty well where girls finished first and the boys finished second. Yeah, and then uh, not, I feel like not much else is happening, but I think just from what I've heard from students, just like general thoughts, is there is some like nervousness right now around rising COVID cases, like unknowing how much longer we'll be in school for, uh, how long we'll stay through, how like, how many more cases we'll get and how long we'll stay through that. So I think that's kind of just general thoughts around the school right now. Yeah, we weren't sure, um, just based from our last conversation, if there were any questions from the school committee that we could possibly yeah. answer about the student like, body. And I see that we also have a lot of <laughs> other CCHS students here with us that maybe they can chime in too. I don't have a question uh, right now, but I certainly uh, think I speak for my colleagues on the committee when, when I say thank you for staying uh, CCHS strong, uh, I might say, because uh, this has not been easy for, uh, for the students and the faculty and the staff to keep the schools functioning and safe. And we share your worry, Amy and Linda. Um, and. Uh, uh, I think the resilience you're showing is uh, something that we have, uh, uh, we, we can all take pride in. So uh, any anything we can do to uh, recognize your efforts, we want to do it and uh, have you extend that to your, your uh, uh, fellow students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now you said questions, so certainly any of us can, can pipe up. Um, do you have questions for us about what it's going to take to get uh, through to the Thanksgiving holidays? And very importantly, uh, do you have questions about what you and I have to do to stay safe through those holidays? We don't want to be gathering with family and friends and then causing a new set of problems that jeopardize our return. Um, and, and we know that's happening elsewhere. Yeah, I think that's definitely probably part of uh, people's like, you know, unknowing right now like from students, like what's going to happen uh, after Thanksgiving, like how, you know, what that kind of thing. I think it just right now, I think, I think everyone feels probably both administration and teachers and students just not knowing what's going to happen going forward because there is so much like uncharted territory there is here. So I think that's probably just generally what people are thinking right now. Especially um, come winter time with flu season, um, that also adds an extra challenge, I guess, when it comes to dealing a pan dealing with a pandemic. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has ever has even touched on the idea of winter sports. I think most winter sports I know run inside unless it's um, skiing. So I feel as though like maybe alpine skiing can work, um, social distantly, social distance, distantly, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, I assume like wrestling is not an option. Maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm gonna say wrestling's not an option right off the top. <laughs> but uh, we're waiting on MIAA. Originally, last week we had to wait for one of the state organizations. Um, EEA had to release their updated guidance. Now MIAA takes a look at that and translates it. And then the league will take a look at it and translate it. So all that's in step. I think you're right to wonder, Linda, because the indoor sports are higher risk and some of them are high risk just in general, hockey and basketball. So we don't have answers yet. I, they're going to come over the next week or so, I expect, because anything that's going to happen in the next season would, is due to start November 30th. 
Um, I, I don't know more than that, but I think you're right to, to wonder. So we'll, we'll take it as it comes here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I want to thank everybody for getting, you know, for doing such a great job through the fall season. Um, that was really terrific that we could have races and games and um, absolutely. So it's a blessing. Thank you. So, so Sarah, just back to reports. I will oh. deliver a report on the MASC annual uh, oh. assembly next week. Next week. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. So with that, uh, for both committees, Concord and Concord Carlisle, we have recognitions. Uh, Dr. Hunter, we'll turn it over to you, please, for the Concord Education Fund. Yeah, so we want to invite uh, Denise Jansen and Leah Butler. I know they're here. At least I see Leah. Uh, and Denise, too. I, I don't know if I've seen Denise. I'm here. Sean, Sean's mm -hmm. here. There they are. Sean's it's here, too. Like, Hello. where's Waldo here tonight? I think, yeah, Sean's I think we need to speak. Here. And then we pop up. Hello. Yeah. Sean Miller and Denise Jansen are here, and, and Leah Butler. Mm -hmm. Uh, CEF, as we are really fortunate so often, uh, reached out back as we were reopening school and asked if there was any anything they could do to help. Um, within a couple of weeks, it became really clear that with the increased uh, bike ridership, we had a need for help with bike racks. Um, and those who know more than I suggested some other supplies and uh, work kits that could help with inflating and other other pieces that of things that might need to be done on a bike um literally we just we were trying to stage them and you know have them upright but it didn't take much for a big pile of bikes to be the issue at the end of every day so we're in their um never-ending way they responded essentially immediately and uh have already approved uh racks and workstations for k-8 the three elementary schools and the middle schools that is where our biggest needs are. That's why they went that direction after consulting with us. And um, at the end of tonight, you're, you have an agenda item to approve a donation of about $16,500. And we're just so, so grateful. So I'll turn it over to them from there. We're glad they're here to speak on how this happened on their end, but we're just here to express deep gratitude. So, yeah. Hi, thank you for having CEF, everybody. So my name is Sean Miller. I'm the grants chair for CEF. And uh, this is, I think, one of the best parts of being part of CEF, coming to this, this meeting here and be able to, you know, fund a lot of the creative ideas and initiatives from teachers. And this one, too, helping out in these COVID times. So also representing CEF is Denise Jansen, co-president, and Leah Butler, co-president, who have also joined us tonight. Uh, yes. Yeah, so in general, um, Leah, uh, Dr. Hunter came to us uh, several weeks ago and said, hey, we, we've got a need for bikes. I get it. Or bike racks, I should say. I get it. I live outside of Throw. I see a lot more bikes going down West and Center Street. But anyway, we've been able to fund um, 13. I'm going to try to show it to you to give you an image. But we've been able to fund 13 standard bike racks. Three are going to Elcott. Seven are going to Willard, yeah. two are going to Throw, and one is going to the Concord Middle School. Okay, that was funding number one. And then uh, Dr. Hunter just mentioned some other things like a work stand. So we also are funding what's called a deluxe public work stand. So basically, we're going to have one at each school, two at the high school, though, and two at the middle school. And these work stands have all like the hex, hex keys. They've got, that's how you can blow up your tires or inflate your tires. It's got uh, all the tools that a bike requires in order to get a quick tune up and fixed. Um, so spot on, the CEF grant is $16,504.95. Uh, we're very happy to uh, give this to, uh, to the district. And any questions, let me know. The CEF has made a lot of people very happy. <laughs> Fantastic. 
Yeah, I mean, we're, I, I think it was founded in the mid-80s or early 90s. If you look at the, the alum who run this organization, it's all conquered parents. It's all volunteer work. We're a nonprofit organization. And our sole focus is to help fund creative, innovative ideas that come from the district. And I will tell you that uh, this is my sixth year. And uh, there's been a lot of great initiatives that have come from your teams in this district. So we're excited about it. It's, uh, you know, it's a neat thing to, to see the whole process and a better thing to be able to fund it at the end of the day. Thank you. Can I just mention too, to Lori's point about this happening on a dime, I mean, Generally, people say never ask a committee for a decision, but boy, if I ever want a decision, I'm coming <laughs> to you guys, because this is incredible how, you know, the need came up and you're just fulfilling it for us right away. And it's so deeply appreciated. It's amazing. Yeah, I want to give credit to uh, Bill Stone. He couldn't make it tonight, but he he led this project for the CEF team. That's great. And uh, as soon as he got the request from uh, Dr. Hunter, he was all over it. And uh, I definitely give him credit for expediting this. We are out of grant season right now. We usually do them all between the January and February, and sometimes we'll extend it out. Uh, so those out of, say, out of cycle grants tend to be a little bit slower and a little more um, inspection, but it flew through on this one. Yeah. Unanimous. That's great. I, I wonder, Leah, Denise, and Sean, could you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the current fundraising so that uh, while we've got some airtime here, people can uh, learn how to hook, connect up Absolutely. We can uh, be found at ConcordEdFund.org. Everything is there. Um, we are, we have so much social media going on right now on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, many of you have probably seen our huge Apple downtown at Concord Library. Uh, we're running what we call the Apple Challenge now. Usually we have a huge gala and it's a big fundraiser for us and we, we usually sell out every fall and this year we had to go virtual so we decided to do a five mile challenge whether you want to hike it or run it or bike it um, whatever your challenge is we're happy to have you register we have um, swag bags that we're delivering to people this week and it's been great we've had very generous sponsors we had lots of registrants so we're really excited this is a whole new thing for us and a new way to fundraise so look for us on all social media outlets we're there so i can get a lawn sign and make a donation by going to the website if i'm correct absolutely org. it's it's an attractive lawn sign <laughs> Thank you, but your guys were able to 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 shift uh, gears so easily, um, or maybe not so easily, but so <laughs> so effectively. I have to say, we have an incredible board, and this year, um, it's it's stronger than in years past. Even everyone's so full of energy and and so smart and and always available, and it's a really good crew. So I'm looking forward to seeing the grants uh, come through in February because. We're ready for them. Well, it strikes me that much of what you do uh, uh, is uh, uh, something that generates the same kind of thinking that teachers have, and that is that the, the efforts you make today are going to have uh, or this ripple effect in the future, and you can't quantify it fully, um, but it's going to have a very lasting value, and that's been uh, the nature of all your work over the years. Um, where you've touched many more people than a school committee, you've, where you've ultimately uh, reached the children that you and I are supporting together in our, in our work. So you've got our heartfelt thanks. I hope you share it with your, your board and your key volunteers. Absolutely, Will. Thank you so much for that. So we will be doing a formal vote later on. That's a pro forma acceptance of your gift. Uh, we won't... Uh, uh, insist that you stick around for that uh, that uh, vote. Uh, this was the important thing that we could uh, speak together and that you could hear our, our appreciation and know that it comes from all the, the students and faculty that benefit. Because it's not just students riding those bicycles, no, is it? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah those, those workstations, they're gonna help out other people too. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yep. right you are, yeah. So thank you so very much. Okay, 
So uh, I'll, I'll repeat as we finish up, uh, let's uh, head to that website and uh, remember the Concord Ed Fund. Uh, the, they need us just the way we need them. And it's very much a reciprocal uh, arrangement this community has. Thank you. No. So if there's no other comments on that very kind and uh, gracious support from the Concord Education Fund, uh, Sarah, I think we're going to we have can... you turn it over to Mr. Namichi. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Namichi, and and to everyone that you have brought today. Um, I want to welcome everyone for the cultural competency and anti-racism update. I think it, there are are a lot of people presenting, but a lot of us are all new faces to one another. So it, it might be worth our while to let everybody have a chance to introduce themselves briefly so we can understand um, well, grades and, um, and and organizations that they're with and um, or clubs and yep, that would be fantastic. And maybe we'll quickly go through the school committee board just to introduce ourselves to you all as well. Uh, so I'm Sarah. I have a daughter, Margo, who's in 10th grade. And um, this is my first year on the school committee. I come to you from Carlisle on the region, first year on the region. Yeah. Court. Uh, my name is Court Booth, and uh, I have uh, two sons, both of whom are CCHS graduates. And uh, I know they uh, know some siblings of people uh, in the room with us right now. And uh, they have fond memories of their time at CCHS. Okay, now we can go in alphabetical order maybe with Alexa. Hi guys, um, I'm Alexa Anderson. I have three kids who are currently um, in the Concord School District. I don't have anyone at the high school yet, but I've got two kids at Willard and um, a middle schooler um, at Peabody. Nice to see you all. Heather? That's right, we skipped court. We're out of <laughs> you just I know, I know. Me after him. <laughs> he caught me off guard. After I'm Heather. This goes back to normal. Yeah. I know, thanks for the tea up. I'm Heather, um, this is my sixth year on the school committee. And I have three kids in the system. I have a sophomore and an eighth grader and a sixth grader. And um, just love all my interactions with you guys. I'm so excited to see you all here because I love seeing students and having you guys join us at our meetings. It makes it so much more fun. So thanks for being here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Fatima Mesdad. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I am new to the school committee and uh, I have two sons, um, freshman and a junior at CCHS. And I am thrilled to have you uh, present to us this evening. And um, I'm reminded, reminding myself and everyone that we're all here for you. This is what we do. It's all for you guys. So thank you for sharing with us what's happening in the school. Uh, hello, this is Eva Mustafi. I'm uh, calling in today. Um, I, uh, I am a parent and a um, school committee member on the region side from Carlisle. I have uh, two high school students, one of them, uh, Ariana, at 10th uh, grader at CCHS. And I also have a recent um, high school graduate and now a student at a university. Um, uh, just a very grateful parent because he was very, very well prepared for what was ahead of him. Um, so successful and happy. Um, so welcome and thank you. Hi, Cynthia Rainey. I'm in my second year. I have two sons who graduated from CCHS in 16 and 18. And I'm lo really looking forward to hearing from you all. Thank you. So, Mr. Namichi, how would you like to organize this? Uh, are introductions in order for students? Do you want to do a call out so that that? Absolutely. So, first and foremost, um, if I can ask, am I able to share my screen? You should be able to, Andrew. I think I got you real set up. Okay, and so the students will introduce themselves as we transition uh, through each slide on the presentation. 
Uh, but before I start, I certainly want to thank uh, you, Ms. Wilson and Mr. Booth, members of the school committee and Dr. Hunter uh, for the invitation to share with the community the important work being done in our school district regarding cultural competency and anti-racism. Our presentation this evening involves the collective work of faculty advisors and student leaders from respective student-run clubs at Concord Middle School and Concord Carlisle High School. What you will see and hear tonight in our presentation are concrete initiatives and projects being taken by our student leaders and their respective club members who have been proactive in bringing about a more inclusive and equitable school community for our Boston, Concord, and Carlisle students and families. I ask that you wait until the end to pose your questions and comments. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. So just give me a second here. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So our first uh, student run club is the newly cemented Black Student Union uh, at Concord Carlisle High School. Uh, and the student advisor is Ms. Andrade. So I'm just gonna hand it over to Ms. Andrade uh, to get us started. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jamie Andrade uh, and I'll be working with the Black Student Union this year. Um, so it seems like the students had uh, developed this idea uh, far before I got on board. And I know that um, CCHS has had a history of black students organizing in different uh, fashions, um, but the, these students are proposing or have proposed um, that this be a formal group. Um, so Michaela Francois, do you wanna lead us through um, your first slide that you have here for us? Yes, hi, my name is Michaela Francois. I'm a current senior and I'm part of the MECO program. And yeah, so we as MECO students saw like this common like problem um, within like our school community. And so that problem is like a lack of education based around African American history. And we saw that like in our history classes, the education we were learning about like our African American culture was very surface level. Um, and it led to many instances of racism and discrimination within CC and its community. And so as a solution, we wanna provide a safe space for black students to support the unheard voices of our community, but to also unite the MECO students together. And so we're hoping that we can teach and inspire all students about our African-American history through our black student union and coming together to enhance our voices at CC. And next, Joseph's gonna introduce himself. Hi everyone, my name is Joseph Van. I'm also in the 12th grade, um, you know, part of the Black Student Union. So as said before, um, well actually I'll start with um, some initiatives. So um, we started this year and some initiatives that we really wanted to get done, do, do like the really big, broad goal of the BSU um, is to really unite African-American students of Boston, Concord, um, and Carlisle communities because we really want them to have a space where we they can share their story and not have to feel ridiculed or have to, you know, defend themselves afterwards. They can just say what they need to say, you know, and they can have people who can um, relate to their experiences and be in, a, be in a space where, you know, everyone understands each other. Um, so some first year goals that we wanted to get done this year, hopefully, um, we wanted to have a Black History Month event. I know with COVID um, and the, we don't know how this is gonna look, uh, we're still working out some ideas and I like, one of our ideas was having like a pop-up like movie um, showing, because one of our, uh, our, our, um, our counselor, Mr. Andrade, she has like a drive-in movie set up. So that was one of the ideas we were thinking of. We also wanted to pair up with an organization 
or maybe, you know, have a speaker come um, and have it give a speech or, or talk about something related to Black history in like a Zoom call or anything like that, just to have um, just like a, a moment outside of school where people can go and learn more about Black history and, or um, a certain Black person or just anything um, Black related. <laughs> um, you also wanted to do a sponsor a dance. I know last year we had a dance um, for, we were going to have a dance for the um, Black History Month, but sadly it got canceled due to uh, COVID. So we didn't know how that was going to look this year, but if COVID, if we get a vaccine maybe, or maybe it clears up or anything like that, we were still hoping that we could do some sort of dance um, or again, like event uh, related to Black History. And also we want to do a sale, you know, a lot, the sales are very popular at Concarello High School, you know, the, the bake, bakery sales, stickers. I recently uh, did a sticker sale with uh, inter intersections where we went around selling stickers, we got a lot of money. So we wanted to do um, one of those sales, hopefully to fundraise some money to help uh, fund some of the events that we want to hold. Um, and just to give sort of structure to our club, so some positions that we would have, so we would have grade representatives, you know, uh, senior leaders, junior leaders, sophomore leaders, freshman leaders, leaders in each one that can help um, us run the club and can be spread out amongst the grades. So there, there can be some leadership in each grade. We also uh, traditionally have a president and vice president, as do many clubs, um, and also have leadership uh, positions for leadership that are not the grade represent the grade representatively of uh, roles, but just like for projects that we would like to start, it can have, we have some leaders um, for those projects. And lastly, we just want to talk about support. Um, I think in the history of CC, there have been a lot of clubs that kind of represent the minority and try to make that safe space. You know, the big the example coming to my head right now is Spectrum. Um, but in the past, we felt that you know their what, what they've done hasn't been really broadcasted a lot to the, the masses. You know, a lot of students uh, overlook Spectrum and, and, and the events that they hold, or they just don't know about it at all. Um, it also, Spectrum is viewed, it isn't viewed as what it should be, or it's a safe space for not just LGBTQ, but also a space for allies. It's viewed as only LGBTQ. Um, so I think the support that we wanted from teachers and students is... Uh, that, you know, just to help us get the word out, you know, get the, you know, events that we're holding, um, to just get out to the masses that people know that we actually exist. Um, and even though our Black Student Union is really for the African American students, we also just wanted to, in general, like when speaking about it, that, you know, there are allies throughout the school, you know, and that there are people supporting the club who don't have to be in the club exactly. Um, you know, just knowing that it exists, uh, helping and supporting events that we hold is a really big step towards um, improving the community um, and, and uh, space at Concord. Uh, and just to touch on what Joseph was saying, when the group uh, was beginning to form, we had a conversation about um, whether the Black Student Union should be for students who identify as Black or more open for um, those that we call allies. And what CCHS is doing so well already is hosting many different clubs, groups, and spaces for um, these types of dialogues. And so we thought um, that we could deepen the dialogues that are already happening by having this space for Black students to first articulate what it is that they even want to say to then go and engage in these other groups like intersections um, and then to be able to also reach out to the CC community and pull um, folks in. Um, and then, you know, Joseph, Michaela, Khalees, they're all upperclassmen. And so we had to think about um, recruitment and leadership training and having a safe space where, you know, we can have the younger students come in and learn those leadership skills in a safe space and then be able to go out um, and work with these kinds of topics in the greater school community. Oh, and just to add on one more thing to what Ms. And uh, Andrade was saying, um, I think it holds a lot of power um, and an ally who doesn't have to, you know, be there, doesn't have to, you know, be hearing the, exper the experiences in order to be supporting the cause. Um, I think that that really shows a lot about your character and the shows that you're there to support and don't have to, you know, 
I have to be like, oh, I have to hear it in order for me to support it. I have to like see it and support it. Um, and I, I think that what, what, what we're doing, as Sanjade is saying, we really want to create a safe space for African Americans to share their experiences, but we don't want it to be like allies feel like they're cut off or they're missing something because we want it to be as if, you know, we can reach, once we're comfortable in our space, we can reach out, as Sanjade was saying, um, and you guys can still be there. And you guys can still be understanding. You guys can still be accepting um, of our struggles. Like once we've been able to kind of share with people that uh, can relate to them and we can still reach out. You guys will still be there to um, help us through. So thank you. Thank you, Joseph, uh, Michaela, and Ms. Andrade. Uh, next up is the Intersections Club. Um, I am the advisor for the club, but our student leaders joining us this evening um, is uh, Vicky Chan, Stephanie Donovan, and Akshaya Sethram. Uh, so Vicky, I'll hand it off to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing us to come speak with you all tonight. My name is Vicky Chan. I'm a senior. Um, all three of us are seniors, and I'm from Carlisle, and I use she, her pronouns. Hi, my name is Stephanie. I also use she, her pronouns, and I am from Boston. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Akshaya. Um, I live in Concord, and I also use she, her pronouns. So just to give a little brief overview to how our club founded and how it got started, um, Stephanie, Akshaya, and I attended the EDCO Leadership Conference where we had the opportunity to speak with students in surrounding towns um, near us, where we, all, we were able to gain some insight to what's going on in other schools and initiatives happening there. And that's where we got the idea of creating a space and a club like Intersections at, at CCHS. And so some things that we've done in the past have been like a boba tea sale. Um, and then during COVID in the summer, we also held a Black Lives Matter demonstration in Concord Center. And we've also, um, in the summer, really excitingly, we had an online conference with 10 different schools across Massachusetts, where we invited high schooler, uh, high school leaders to talk on initiatives going on in their schools. And we had attendance of over 100 people at that conference. Um, and so with that, some ongoing things we can talk about. Um, and Stephanie can introduce those. Yeah, so as Vicky said, as a result of our Intersections X Massachusetts conference, we formed a coalition with the schools in Massachusetts with students who are doing similar social justice issues. Um, a school actually called Bromfield, which we had never heard of, actually as a result of the conference started their own club in their school. So we all come together and help each other out, give each other ideas, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to engage with each other to do a Massachusetts wide fundraiser, or maybe we all set up something in our schools, such as like a lecture or an event that we all can participate in. Um, a few other projects that we have been doing is our Q the Culture show on WIQH, which is our local high school channel. There we do a bunch of different things. We talk with our senior leaders. One of them is Joseph Van, um, Vicky Akshay and I, JJ in Dallas and Hana, who are all part of the club and are kind of like our co people who we've always been with and there we talk about issues globally as well as in our school district so a few things we have co covered is um talking with teachers about what they think about the curriculum as well as like their own social justice so usually we don't think of like our teachers as social justice but we are able to like talk with them how even in their youth and now they're able to engage what they're interested in and they kind of inspired us through being on our show. Um, another thing that we have been doing ongoing is our discussion. So we kind of started this up over the summer as a result of the recent rise in the Black Lives Matter movement. And so there we've been able to just discuss with our club members what they feel on different topics, as well as getting insights about how we sh as a club should engage our community. And we've been really successful. We've had like around like 30 people coming each week, um, averaging about more than that even 
And so another thing that we have been focusing on as well is our flag project, which we started at the start of our club. And basically what's involved in that is that we took a survey of our entire student population and recorded what con their country of origin. And so we have ordered all of those flags. There's about over 60 of them and we're planning to put them up in our cafeteria. So they'll be right as you walk in the cafeteria, you'll see flags of everyone represented in the community. And it's, I think it's just a really powerful thing. Um, so Akshaya is going to talk a little bit about what we're doing right now. Yes, so to talk about our most recent initiatives, um, a group of CC alumni uh, who created the group 01742 Anti-Racism had actually reached out to us over the summer to kind of get a sense of, you know, the climate at CCHS. And, you know, we all agreed from that that the conversation surrounding anti-racism and cultural competency shouldn't just be starting in high school. So from that, we created the idea of an early education bias training. And we have our student leaders, Anna Brooks and Sola Stacy, who created the group Crossroads. So it's um, a YouTube channel where they post videos, reading books, embracing diversity, acceptance, and anti-racism to expose like, you know, young kids to cultural competency and just seeing other people who like they might not see on a daily basis. And, you know, if we have any teachers, we'd love for you to check it out and share it with your students. And then our next big initiative is our sticker sale. So we have a lot of conversations in our club surrounding racial, racial justice, but we definitely like recognize the importance of like taking action and supporting movements that are like doing the groundwork for, you know, the movement towards equality. So we planned this during the summer and we have three stickers, two of them created by Vicky and then another one created by Clara's son. And we've gotten a lot of support from students, teachers, and admin. And we've raised $460 as of today. So it's been super fun. And we're donating to Black Lives Matter Boston Chapter and Campaign Zero. All right. Thank you, Akshaya, Vicky, Stephanie, um, for all your work with Intersections. Next up is our CMS Concord Middle School Rise Club. And the faculty advisor is Ms. Olkers Bullwinkle and Ms. Uh, Jemerson. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not going to say much at all because really the students are the show. Um, just want to thank you for the invitation to come and speak. Um, and I'm also so proud of all these high schoolers. I know so many of you. So, yay! It's so great to see you continuing to do great things as not at all a surprise. Um, and I hope that you'll be inspired too by our rising um, middle schoolers who are equally excited about um, bringing more social justice and community building and, uh, and awareness of issues of race to the greater Concord community. Um, so, and I don't know, Ms. J, if you wanna say anything, cause you're a co-leader. <laughs> And of course, my dog chooses now to bark. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> so I will turn it over. I think, Ludney, you were going to introduce the leaders of the club, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. It's so crazy. Um, hi, I'm Ludney Charles. I live in Boston. And I'm going to introduce the members of the club. We have Giovanni Brooks, Rodney Ray, Alina Jones, Amelia Rosak, Destiny. Pires, John Patel, and me, Ludney. Thanks, Ludney. And we're, we're fortunate to have so many other students, um, but these are the students who are going to be speaking with us tonight. So that's why they're listed. And I know John would be very upset. He is Jack Patel. So I just want to make sure we correct that. He is Jack. Um, thank you, Ludney. And Jack, if you're with us, are you here, Jack? Yes. Okay, perfect. If you want to read our statement. Okay. Um, Rise is a movement and after school clubs of kids from different races and backgrounds who come together, doing what needs to get done for our CMS community. A place where we talk seriously and respectfully about the social issues going on in the world and stand together in difficult moments. Thank you. And that was a statement we collectively developed together with everyone sort of sharing in over Zoom through breakout rooms. Who are we really and what are we about? So I was really proud of the students for coming up with what I feel like is a very powerful statement of purpose and vision. Um, and do you want to just read, Jack, what RISE, R-I-S-E stands for? 
sorry. Um, it stands for Racial Identity Society Empowerment. Thank you. And Alina, I know I saw you with us. You want to talk about the rest of the slide? Hi, I'm Alina. I'm an eighth grader at CMS. And the flags just represent our um, RISE community and how we all came together. And yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like similar to the high school, um, the Intersections Club with your flags in the cafeteria. We've done that too. We didn't purchase real flags, which is sort of printed out from the internet. Um, and this is just a representation of the students who were at our last meeting, some of the flags, again, showing just the diverse identity, um, which is really great to see at Concord Middle School. And the many years I've been here, I think it's changing more and more and becoming more uh, culturally diverse and interesting. So. Do you want to go to the next slide, Mr. Namichi? And I can't remember who was going first here, but was it? Yeah, that was me. I'm just going to share. Okay. Great. Thanks, Rodney. Yes. Um, basically, the first two things is what we've done is basically um, we've had two dances for Black History Month. Um, and we've donated um, the profits of that to an organization called Color of Change. Um, and then we also like in the dances, we've decorated like uh, areas around with like um, pictures of black role models and flags. Um, and then um, we had like the first dance, well, first like social or dance um, for six to eight. Um, CMS, well, for six to eighth graders in the CMS community um, with lots of um, um, volunteer chaperones and teachers as well as people that like volunteer. I can hand it to you. Good, thanks. And as a teacher, I can say every time someone tries to throw a dance, it's it's a little bit of a difficult challenge to get teacher chaperones to show up, but we had floods of teachers wanting to come and support the students in this group when they did the first ever sixth, seventh, and eighth. It was a sixth grade social at the Peabody building um, and a seventh and eighth grade dance where the students had planned their playlists ahead of time and sent them to DJs to play not just sort of popular music today, but uh, culturally representative music. And it was a nice blend of both. Um, and I think, was it Amelia, are you gonna speak next? Um, I, I mean, I think it was Destiny. Oh, Destiny, thank you. Yeah. We, um, there was a lot of racial incidents at our school, so we did a video to address it. And also we, um, about, like, about two years ago, we went to the movie theater to watch a film about the movie, The Hate You Give and how and how like it kind of could like connect it to us. Oh, thank you. And it was it was a great field trip to go into a theater in Boston. And I know we've heard in lots of different environments and different occasions, the need for, for Concord residents and, and community members to head into Boston. So it was a fun field trip where we all met in the, um, and went to the theater and saw this film and really had some powerful discussions about how close to home it hit for some of the students and some of our faculty as well. Um, and we hope to re to re repeat an experience like this in the future. Um, but that was just some of the things that we've done that we feel proud of and some things we hope to do. I think Giovanni, were you gonna speak next? Yes, I'm a seventh grader at Sanborn. And some things that we hope to do is paint the bathroom with positive messages because due to the fact that there are some racial comments that weren't so good and we would hope to paint it and we would hope to get more people to join the Rise Club to spread more awareness and present a presentation to all students at home base so we could wear more people. Good, thank you. And I think, um, Amelia, were you gonna finish us off? A bulletin board and a socially distanced movie for discussion and a cultural fair with food, like so many people could come. Great, thank you. And I think some of these ideas were inspired, all, all student um, suggested, but inspired by what I heard the high school students say too, that there just doesn't seem to be enough or deep enough sense of education um, about the different cultures, the non-dominant cultures um, in our school. So whether it's through little lessons that we do in the advisories through home base or having the cultural fair with food, which we planned for last year. And unfortunately with COVID, it was canceled. Um, but that was really inspired by back in the day. And some of you, I think, 
were here, some of our seniors, when we used to have this the summer academy um, and had the students come and share a favorite food from their home culture and talk about it and present it. And it was just, it was such a wonderful day of celebration. And we wanted to do it on a bigger kind of level with the whole school. So I know, I know that's been done at the high school as well. So those are some things um, happening at the middle school. And again, I don't know, Miss J, I know you're here. I don't know if you wanted to add on to anything. Or any of the students. She's on mute. Oh, okay. I was like, I can't see her, so I don't know. Miss J, can you hear us? You might have to unmute yourself. All right, it looks like we'll have to come back to Ms. J. Okay. Uh, so let's now move to uh, one of our last um, clubs, uh, Unified Arts, and the faculty advisor is uh, Ms. Tracy Dunn. Ms. Dunn? Hi there. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I'm doing this from my phone. I'm usually on my computer, so I wasn't sure. Um, I'm also unable to see who's in attendance, but I think we might have the full club today. Um, we're a much more informal initiative that started this summer uh, at, a, at a moment where I was working with a few different students at the end of last year to build collaborative, positive, and inclusive visual culture at Concord Carlisle. And... Um, then we moved into the summer months and there was still sort of an interest and a, a need for us to continue trying to develop some of that positive visual culture more than ever. So I'm going to just leave it to the students to share their thoughts, um, but it is only five students large at this point. And the idea is to really focus on this core group, learning how to collaborate and get to know one another. and expand perhaps a little more slowly than some of the other beautiful um, initiatives that we've heard about where it's it's maybe just a, a smaller scale for the students who might prefer to learn those skills in a slightly quieter uh, scenario where we're working on visual arts together side by side. So Michaela, are you are you out there to kick us off? Hey, I am. Oh, good, thank you. And Andrew, you may need to advance the slide. Yep, and I believe Kesh, uh, Keshla Sanin is here as well. Oh, good, good, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Ms. Sun was just saying, we all came together from different backgrounds, Concord, Carlisle, and Boston, and we all met with each other this summer, which was really nice because beyond just talking about art, we got to share like who we were and um, our background. And so it was nice getting to meet each other because otherwise I don't think we all would have had the chance to, you know, get together in school because we didn't know each other. So it was nice bringing a diverse group together um, and seeing how we can really feed off of each other's like um, experiences and bring it together into one piece of art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kesh, if you're out there, you can just talk about any connections that you felt throughout the experience so far. Yeah, so um, usually I don't really interact much with anyone that's from well, I mean, I do speak to some people from Concord, but never Carlisle. And so through this um, club, I was able to meet people I probably wouldn't have talked to within school. Um, and all of this is while I'm doing what I love, which is art. So, yeah. Perfect. And Kesh has been a huge contributor. He feels a bit more confident in the arts and Michaela less so. And so she's been bringing her strength and organization and having a strong voice. And each person's kind of learned from one another from each other's strengths. So thank you, Kesh. Um, so let's see who else is here. Is Aaron out there? Aaron Challenger? Uh, yeah, I am. Oh, hi. <laughs> so uh, the main objective of Unified Arts is to create the visual culture at CCHS that will be positive and inclusive because we all come from different scenarios in different places. Um, physically on the map, it's not just gone through Carlisle. And this was a great way for us to kind of get out of the usual um, form of school and connect through maybe 
a less conventional way about our experiences and our knowledge on current racial tensions in the world in Concord and in Massachusetts. Mm, thank you. Um, so I think at this point, I'm, I'm just not sure who is out there. Maybe um, is August? Garachi, are you there too? Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, here. Excellent. So if Andrew, you want to advance the slide. <laughs> you took the picture. I didn't even try to line you up, uh -huh. but there you are. All right, here I am. All right, so um, yeah. Um, so we really, this group has been super collaborative. It's definitely been like, I don't know. Um, it's really been a unifying place to be. Um, and I don't know, it's just been incredible to bring people together and, um, you know, talk about issues that we face and find ways to put that into art, which is something that a couple of us care about. I mean, like all of us care about it, of course, but like some of us are super passionate about it and some of us just want to make change and it's incredible to bring that all together. Um, and COVID has definitely made it super hard, but I've been super inspired by how, um, inspired everybody is to still get together and still work on things. Like we worked on a mural over the summer. It was so wonderful to like get together with people after being in quarantine for months and months and months. And so I feel like it has definitely been more than just, you know, it's been really a unifying experience and we hope to represent that in the art that we create together. Yeah, thanks Gus. And I'll and I'll just share real quickly that um, one thing that came to mind while Gus was talking is that I think sometimes when you try and take a conversation and translate it into something visual and some symbols, then you're starting to really distill what, you know, what is the nugget of the conversation and what is it that we all share in believing is okay to communicate and then how do we want to communicate it? And so it's it's a group that's been thoughtful and moving forward very carefully, um, knowing that whatever they create would be on display. And it's clear that they care very deeply about um, the quality of their conversations and the quality of the message that they're sharing with the larger school community. So thanks, Gus. Um, and I think Sydney is here too, uh, and maybe can close out our presentation. Yeah, so um, I, my name is Sydney. I'm a junior at Concord Carlisle High School, and I, I would assume, I would, I would argue of the entire group, I'm probably the least artistically gifted, um, and artistically inclined, specifically before this initiative took place, because I kind of um, am more of like a math and science geared person. And during the construction of this mural across the summer, it at points was really challenging <laughs> to, to let go of that aspect of it and kind of just like let the ideas flow and see how it looked. Because at the end of the day, it's less about the physical art that kind of comes out of this and more about the connections made within the program and within the group of people. And it was, it was really, um, it was really new and nice to, to hear a different perspective and learn, like, there's another side of each story. It's not just you're from Concord or you're from Carlisle or you're from Boston. It's, there's a, a whole, a whole spectrum of people coming from different places, um, within that. And so that was really nice to be able to connect with students, even while we're during this, like we're in the middle of this challenge time where it's difficult to even leave your house, let alone mm -hmm. collaborate and create a piece of art that's going to be, you know, displayed in public, but it's, it's been a really enjoyable experience, especially meeting new people who otherwise I would never have had the opportunity of getting to know. Mm. Thank you, Sydney. Yeah. And I do feel like Sydney put herself out there and was vulnerable with some of the things that are really challenging about, um, you know, getting dirty, being messy, being imperfect. As she said, she likes things that are a little more linear. So beyond just talking about the actual issues that we care so deeply about, there's just helping each other through different moments and building um, relationships that seems to be at the core of the work. So we are hoping to include more people over time, but, um, you know, as everyone has cited here tonight, COVID makes that a little bit challenging, but we are still plugging away and finding our way through it. So we do appreciate all the support we've been getting from Andrew and the administration and, and people to pursue this work. 
So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Dunn. Thank you, students. And I am actually gonna go back to CMS Rise so we can hear from Ms. J. Hi, everyone. I'm Deborah Jemison, and I um, work with the Rise Group with Ms. Okers, uh, Bo Winkle. And um, the only thing I wanted to add into what we're hoping to do is to come together with, um, I was in a, a book club over the summer with uh, parents from Thoreau and Willard, um, and we are coming together to um, look at uh, fifth graders that are coming up to the middle school and bringing uh, RISE students um, or MECO students into uh, the elementaries to start talking about MECO and meeting MECO students because a lot of times they come to sixth grade and they've never met MECO students unless you have been in Alcott. So um, we're going to be going in and um, doing some Zoom meetings with fifth graders. Um, so we're coming together to have those meetings and taking some of the leaders in to meet those concerned parents and start uh, having those conversations. So that's some of the things we're hoping to do coming up. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. J. All right, so let me advance through these slides. Uh, so this really, you know, concludes uh, our presentation this evening. Um, I, I would like to certainly uh, give many, many thanks to our uh, faculty advisors and, of course, our student leaders who are leading uh, the charge in all of this work. Um, they are doing phenomenal, phenomenal work. Uh, so again, uh, thank you uh, to the uh, school committee and Dr. Hunter uh, for giving us the space. Uh, to share all the great work um, that is happening in our school community um, regarding cultural competency and anti-racism. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, and and thank. I just want to piggyback a little bit on what uh, Ms. J and, and Tracy were saying about how everybody's adapting during COVID and how heartened I am to see that I mean, some of these organizations are so new and everybody that it is, it's hard to keep momentum going in the best of times sometimes. And when you face a challenge like what we're facing now, for all of you to be able to adapt, to keep moving forward and to keep pushing these conversations forward is really something phenomenal. And, uh, and, and thank you so much for that. I mean, everything that you guys are doing, you, you strengthen our communities, you strengthen our curriculum, um, and, and I think this is just great. So thanks, Court. Well, I'm, I'm ever impressed. Um, I, I, I've been taking notes because everybody has said things that I want to remember, I want to repeat, I want to echo. Um, uh, Gus, near the end, uh, uh, I talked about learning to collaborate takes time and practice. Um, and I think that's so important that uh, this is going to be a sustained effort um, and uh, it's going to show results. Uh, you all talked about making change. Making change is bold stuff. Um, it's, it's bold. It's risky. We don't always know what it's going to uh, create for outcomes, but you all have a very clear vision of what it should create, and that's going to really improve the odds of, of success. Not only am I impressed with you, I'm impressed with your, uh, your teacher leaders too, student leaders first and foremost, but you have people who have your back, and uh, some of those people are your teachers. And I wonder if I could just put a question to you. Um, when you consider the, uh, the really exceptional teacher allies, I don't want people's names, but how how would you describe them? What what are the characteristics? What are the qualities that uh, that you and I and all of us should be looking for when we identify the truly exceptional uh, teacher allies for the work that you're doing, the making change work you're doing? What do they do that makes them so exceptional? Um, I guess I can start by answering that. In my um, own experience, the teachers that I felt have really been those allies for me um, 
have a, they they reached out to me. I didn't have to go to them. They they wanted to make sure that I was always okay. That I ever felt down. They reached out to see if anything was going on. Um, they just, they just made themselves very aware of their surroundings. You know, made themselves aware of what might have been going on. And they also uh, really helped me throughout the year, whether it be connecting me to um, programs outside of school I could apply to, or just like. Uh, you know, helping me, like, if I did, like, uh, if I got a, like, a bad grade on a test or a homework, like, you know, reaching out and saying, hey, you want to meet and stuff like that. Just, like, little things because, you know, as um, MECO students, our schedule is very, very full. Um, and then we get home late and we have to do our, all our homework and then get on the bus earlier than, like, all, all the students at CC. Um, so I, I think that those, those teachers that really stuck in my mind really made an impact on me were the ones that throughout the year were always supporting me every step of the way. And I, I never had to like reach out to them. You know, it wasn't like, oh, hey, I'm feeling like the downs and stuff like that. Or I had to like email them every single time I was you know, going through something. It was that they were always checking in. They were always, you know, being there for me and making sure that I was always, that I was caught up, that I was, you know, um, being my most successful student and, you know, getting the grades that I wanted to see. Um, without, you know, making me feel excluded from the other students or without making me feel, you know, that I was like different or that I shouldn't belong there. You know, it was very natural and it was very nice to feel that for once. Thank you. Going off of what Joseph said, um, I want to mention, I really like, like, or I really like notice and cherish like the teachers that show that they care more beyond, you know, you just like getting work done. Like they notice if something's not, you know, may not be right. They'll reach out to you and talk to you about like, what could be going on? Like on a more personal level, um, like, you know, everyone has different situations beyond just, you know, going to school, getting their work done. Like there's other things that go on in our lives that can really impact like how we're navigating through this time. And so teachers that really show that they're there to support you and ask, how can they best support you? There's not a lot of teachers I have that do that, but the ones that do, like, I really can tell that they care because they want to see you be successful and they want to know how they can help help you get to that point where you want to be um because even though yeah we're supposed to be independent there is like always room for like a helping hand someone who has more experience wanting to help you get to like a higher level um in your life and also teachers that are able to I guess have like more things in the curriculum like my science class for example not only do we learn about like science but we learn about maybe um important people who are of like african-american um ethnicity that made like changes in science and like inter like to even like different things beyond just what the curriculum involves which i think is also important um because they're bringing things in that are unheard of or that we don't usually hear as like students so i think that's also really powerful also, I want to touch on how um, I know Akshay, Stephanie, and I, like, we've been invited to a lot of webinars or, like, online things that we see teachers at, and I think as much as adults can see student engagement, like, we also notice adult engagement, and we see the same faces repeatedly, and they, like, private message us little things over on Zoom, and that's always really encouraging, um, just seeing that they're showing up, and we understand, like, there were probably a lot of various um, forums like that over the summer as the social climate has been really tense, but we appreciate their effort and um, really like working towards the community that we're trying to work towards as well. And we see them like at our events supporting whatever we're doing and then they like actively will let us know and show their, su their support in that way. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, oh, can I go? Please. Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Khalees. Um, I'm one of the BSU student leaders. I was so sorry, I'm a little late. But um, kind of to answer your question, Mr. Booth, about, you know, teachers and faculty and how they can engage. I think a lot of it has to do with how a teacher basically acknowledges that student who maybe not much speak about their, like, their indifferences, but always, like, you know, is always there, as Joseph said, like, a helping hand, or no, Michaela said, as a helping hand, just to acknowledge that you're there and that, you know, we see that you're trying, especially with all the circumstances that are kind of against you or that you have to deal with, that you're still able to strive and you know how you hard you work as a student. Um, and I've had a, 
a great amount of teachers who not only helped me academically, but helped me mentally and with my personal life. And that just kind of like shows more. Academics is obviously, of course, a big part, but your mental health is kind of, it overlaps that. So I think a teacher who really understands how to not always make things about academics but make things kind of personal in a way that it, it of course is appropriate but sometimes it's good to hear that teachers really understand and they care besides about me getting a letter grade um ask about you know oh how's your mom or da 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 x y z because like that thing kind of like you know it's kind of hard to make connections in concord when you don't have no one really to relate to especially when you're not you're your parents and our part of like the PTG or all this extra stuff. So it's kind of good to like see that your teachers are kind of acknowledging you and your family and how hard they're working to like make sure that you are getting the best education and putting your best foot forward. So I think that kind of matters overall in terms of like, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. So Khalif, if I can pick up on what you're saying and what I'm, one of my takeaways from what all of you have said is, it's, it's not enough to have a belief system about making change. We have to be aware, show up, and do the work. Um, and only in listening to you did I, did, I, did I suddenly also realize that I don't think you were just talking about uh, uh, adult leaders. I think you were talking about the, the support that students uh, who want to make change and students who want to lead offer to each other and and offer to other students who uh, are on the fringes uh, so that you can invite them in to collaborate with you and practice with you around uh, making these kinds of changes. Um, thank you very much. I, I learned a lot. Hi, could I jump in? Go for it, Emma. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for this beautiful presentation. It was, um, I, I'm in awe of and, uh, lead, about your leadership and organizational uh, skills in a, in a time of and navigating the time of COVID um, where around ideas or around things that um, we are going through. It's it's easy to be a spectator. So um, I just wanted to say that um, I, I'm, I'm not sure anyone spoke to, to that yet. Um, you you guys bring so much uh, to us, to the to the student body. Um, uh, the, the information, the interactions, um, all that is so important, um, and it's it's becomes um, it, it's so important in, in uh, uh, forming those human interactions when when students leave uh, uh, high school and um, forming those um, those relationships that you know they uh, uh, that uh, you guys are able to establish in, in high school uh, with other students. My question to you is what um, students and what can we do to be better allies to you guys? Um, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to talk and I don't want to like be the, like, the only one talking, answering the questions. So I'll just like say a little, say a little something just to like let the, let the students come in. Um, but I think, you know, again, being a good ally in the, uh, for us is really uh, linking back to that support we've been talking about, where it's like, you know, um, it, it doesn't have to be teachers as well, it could be like staff members in general at the, at the school, you know, building connections with the students and they all being there. And as Khalees said, not just thinking about academics, but going further than that and also talking about their family and their personal life and seeing how things are like that. Like not being intrusive, obviously, and be like wanting to know every detail, but just checking in, you know, every once in a while because as students, you know, our emotions are just all over the place. You know, one day we're happy, we're having a great time. Other day we just like want to go home and like be in our bed and sleep the entire day because we don't want to do that at all. So I think that like constantly checking in and being that person who goes beyond, you know, just like that school relationship, that academic relationship, where it's like, oh yeah, make sure your papers turned in, or you know, make sure this is like an, uh, all this is that for like grades and stuff like that. You know, just being more personal. 
Um, just to add something, I would say that a good way is to participate in the initiatives that we have started. I know a lot of people, especially the Black Student Union, they're starting up and they have a lot of really cool initiatives. So seeing support from everybody in the community will help just build their club and build what they're all about and allow them to make donations and allow them to gain word around the school, especially how we, as we saw in the middle school, like chaperoning events. Like these are all things that might seem like little, but it helps make our initiatives be that much more powerful and we right now have a sticker fundraiser going on that is so successful because we were able to reach out to teachers and reach out to students and some of them were like oh some of the teachers that we reached out to they're like oh like I don't want to take stickers from students and we're like no like this is about like the whole community like we need everyone to chip in and help out it's not just about the students here so I think just supporting initiatives is like a great way to start so how can we buy stickers if we're not in the building every day is there a way we can buy them online yeah, we have a website that you can actually pre-order and we're mailing them out as well. Okay. Yeah, do, do we want to, I don't know how we can show the website on here. Um, do we want to, do you want to give us the URL at least or, or is it, it's a long complicated one. I think we just don't have a chat. <laughs> I can share my screen again if, if, if that's appropriate. I think you can send a mass email out. If you don't want to send a whole like. Also, can you send us all the presentations? Yes. That would be great. Is, is the website in one of those presentations? Um, no, but I can, can I share my screen just like for the website so people could see the sure. afterwork? Can you? Yes. Should be able to. <laughs> okay, here it is. Oh, great. Here's our website. So it's cchsintersectionstopicsite.com. And here, like, it just has a bit of our bio and the stickers are in this tab. So if you click um, on this tab, you'll be taken to the stickers and how you can purchase them. So yeah. That's great. And yeah. This is <laughs> and it's all through Venmo. Um, and you can just tick off the box saying that you want it mailed. So yeah, thank you. Nice. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I, I'll jump in. And like Eva said, I'm, I'm in awe. I, I'm not sure what to say. And then I could also talk for an hour about all this because you guys are so incredibly inspirational. Um, I, I guess the, the couple things I want to say quickly but before I let somebody else speak is just the, the couple things that really jump out at me here are that you all have made so much progress and done so much to create safe spaces. And I know that some of you mentioned that and, and in some of the others, it, it's just inherent, but the fact that you've created such safe spaces for so many students and that these conversations are happening is just so different from even a few years ago. And it feels like so much progress. Um, I, and the second is just, I'm amazed at how genuine this work is. And of course, you know, all of us, we've, we've seen lists of names of clubs. We know there's the intersections club and the rise and the this and that, but to hear you guys talk about it and see what's really happening. Um, it's not just a club name and, and it's not just a club and you, you're not just a group of kids sitting around talking about what you want to happen. You are making change happen. And it is really, really impressive. Um, I, I'm truly inspired by you and was sitting here listening to all you hoping that you didn't notice how I was tearing up. I'm so impressed by some of what you've done. So I just want to express my thanks. And my initial question was going to be the same as Eva's, which is what, what can we do to be better allies? Um, and I, and so I'll, I'll leave you with that. And also with the, um, the, the request that if you all think of things later that would help from a, you know, school committee, administrative perspective, community parent perspective, please let us know because there are many of us out there who want to support what you're doing and want to be strong allies. Um, and it's great that you all are paving the way to make those connections. Um, so keep us posted and, and thank you for all you're doing. So uh, this is Cynthia Rainey, I'll jump in. Um, I think the thing that really jumps out at me is the relationships that you're all forming with one another and then ambassadors throughout the school. Um, as a nation, I know you all know better than I do. There's a lot of work to be done. And I think you all are very mature in recognizing that. 
Um, so I really feel positive, and I think you all do too, about um, continuing the work and uh, having these difficult conversations. Um, and uh, again, I think that th th these relationships are just so important. Um, so thank you for everything you do and keep, the, keep up the hard work. Guy, I, I have a quick question. Um, I think it was Akshaya, I don't know if you're still here. Um, you had talked about the Crossroads initiative you guys were doing. Um, is there a link to that or how do I find it? Um, as someone with little kids, I think that the way you guys are even, I don't know, working to sort of start the work, the hard work from the bottom up is so incredibly important. And I think um, as students, being able to speak to younger students, sometimes that's a whole different perspective than seeing, you know, an adult. Um, I think sometimes the younger kids so respond to you guys because they see you guys as mentors and role models way more even than, like I said, the crusty old adults in their life. Um, so I didn't know, um, I I'm on your Instagram, but I still can't find a link. Do you guys have it or do how do I search it? Um, so on our Instagram, I think we have a link in our bio with a bunch of other links, which right. also includes the YouTube channel, but I think it's called CCHS Crossroads. Okay. Um, like I said, crusty old adult. It's <laughs> hard for me to find. I'll find it. So you think it's in the bio link? Yes. I just think this is such a great, uh, you know, again, as someone with little kids, I think it's just such a cool, um, cool initiative, you guys. This everything here is just so spectacular. I'm, I love meeting with you guys and seeing you guys. It's just so incredible. So thanks. Okay, I'll go. Um, thank you for everyone who um, has come tonight and uh, thank you for all the work that you have uh, done. Um, I can't think of any words, um, all inspiration, courage, uh, maturity, eloquence, um, all these qualities have been displayed uh, this evening by um, every single one of you. And uh, here it comes again. You know, did it last time. I get very um, uh, emotional. And, um, you know, something I said um, last time we had a similar presentation um, has uh, has changed. You know, I, I, my, my eyes are welling up because what I said was missing last time. I, I see it present uh, this time around. And I am... Uh, very grateful and um, I am absolutely in awe of, of the work that you have uh, done as uh, students and all the adults that have uh, been supportive and um, this has taken a long time and um, a lot of listening and um, Court you asked a question about um, what uh, what it takes, what are the qualities? And um, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, all the adults that have um, been supporting this progress have empathy, have, um, have the ability to put themselves in a child that um, has been voiceless or the introverts that are now included. That there's so much variety in all these clubs and all uh, these initiatives that, um, yes, introverts have a voice. Uh, it's, it's so difficult when you're dealing with uh, minorities because that is the problem, is the, the lack of the voice or um, the, the fear of the, the exposure and um, and all these initiatives have, have addressed that. Um, there, there's always going to be uh, progress to be made and you guys have opened the doors and uh, have invited everyone who, um, who feels that they can contribute or need the help, needs to be heard. Um, and uh, my, my, my notes are all over the place and um, I, 
uh, Khalees, you mentioned a point also that's that's difficult and uh, that hasn't helped in the past. Um, uh, Boston families in particular and other uh, families in Concord Carlisle that uh, don't have parents on the PTG. I, I, I recognize the PTG has been a, an amazing supporter uh, of our schools. And uh, some families uh, don't have parents who are able to, to be present in the school community for physical distance or other circumstances that um, do not give them the time or the, the, the luxury to have that presence. And uh, it's even more isolating for, for the students not to have uh, uh, parents speak up on their behalf or contribute or take part in what is happening. Uh, so that takes a lot of courage also um, for the students to, to, to act on their behalf. And um, again, I am, I am um, just in awe and amazement and I'm, 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 I'm encouraged. I'm very, very encouraged. Um, my, my, my question is, I wonder if uh, some of you can speak to um, what does this atmosphere do to your learning experience? Having these outlets, having this energy, uh, having these ears uh, and having these connections with the adults around you, with each other, with your peers, how does that change your learning experience or academic experience in the classroom? Um, well, for me personally, I don't really learn well in a classroom. And it's nice to do a topic like um, racial injustice and to connect Boston and Concord Carlisle in ways that our school system doesn't really do, um, at least especially in Carlisle and then going into Concord Carlisle, we don't really get very much of that. And so being able to do it in an artistic way and connect with people instead of just like hearing someone lecture me about it was um, a much more cohesive way for me to learn and take it into my daily life. Um, I guess I'll speak again. Sorry, I feel like I'm like speaking so much tonight. Um, but I, I think that with these clubs that we all have and, and these initiatives that we've all started at the club, it just makes our learning experience so much easier and so much more comfortable. You know, I remember like during freshman and sophomore year where I kind of felt like I, I was doing so much and I was trying to do all these clubs. I was trying to do all the activity, you know, be the best in all of them, you know, get straight A's, you know, perfect grades, all that stuff, as well as trying to balance out, you know, being a MECO student, you know, having those late, late nights where you have to do homework until like two o'clock in the morning, you know, wake up at 5.30 for the bus. Um, it was just like, you know, it was, it was a lot to try to handle on my own. I kind of felt like I was very alone, but like with the initiatives that we've all started now, it, it feels like it's more open. It feels like I can come to school and say, oh yeah, I need like help with this or say, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not feeling great today. Cause like, I just, like, this has been like really stressful for me. And I feel more comfortable saying that with like my, not my peers, not just my peers, but also a lot of the um, adults that have, you know, been learning information, you know, and taking in information from what the students that have been telling them and really trying to um, learn from that and also, you know, act on that and do some change in the uh, community. And just another point, you know, from conversations in intersections, I think from hearing like other perspectives, I've been able to view like all my curriculum in such a holistic way, whether that be like, you know, the English books that we're reading, like the perspectives that we're hearing versus, you know, the stories that we often don't hear. And it goes beyond just like, you know, my experiences, but maybe like experiences that I can't relate to as well. I just want to interject here that the other last week I was lucky enough to be on a call with many of the people here today. Um, one of the things that was really nice to hear about was that there is sort of a, a positive feedback loop that happens between the members of this club, the work of the club, and the pushing forward the curriculum of the schools overall. Um, and I don't know if any of you want to share any of those, but there were some nice examples of um, of of how. Uh, having this kind of strong student representation can positively impact the curriculum overall. Um. 
I think I can kind of speak to directly how we were able to talk with teachers um, at Intersections. I know we keep talking about it, but um, we through our podcast, we were able to talk with social studies teachers, and we were also able to connect with English teachers. And in that way, it was really the first time we were able to talk about it outside of the classroom, which was really great. And you know, we were just on Zoom and we had some questions and we asked like, why is this taught? Um, these certain books give off this certain vibe and it like makes us feel this certain way. Or is there a different way to approach this conversation in class mm -hmm. and kind of monitor certain conversations? Because some books that we do read are like, I know one book we were talking about was To Kill a Mockingbird and um, the background of that book and how we can introduce it in a different way that can make students Students feel more comfortable if there's anything behind the history of it and so being able to directly connect with teachers has been like a one opportunity that has never really been given to me um, in the past and I think that has been super great just having a literal space to invite teachers in and be like okay we just like want to talk about this and it's really a conversation it's like not attacking each other um, we're just like trying to talk about how it made us feel and how maybe we can present the curriculum in a different way for students in the future. Just to jump off of that, we've actually started to work with a teacher about presenting an anti-racist thought every day in advisory. So something that we often talk about is how do we engage like the wider school community, the people who really need to hear these things are not going to come to our club. They're not going to engage in our discussions and they're not going to buy a sticker. Like that's just the honest truth of it if they don't believe in our message. So how can we actually get these anti-racist things to each other? And we just thought, you know, advisory is a great place. Every student has to participate in advisory. If we just put out a thought, put out an idea that people need to be aware of, like a microaggression, that could really help our global school community. It's, I'm just going to say, you guys are amazing. You're not only supporting each other, but you're making a huge contribution to other students. And with the idea that it takes sustained effort, uh, I know that we're gonna be uh, asking to communicate with you again and uh, hope, that, hope that you'll uh, keep, us, keep us informed and uh, to echo what uh, Heather Bout said, uh, uh, don't wait for an invitation. Uh, You're also making a sustained effort to the faculty and teachers because they also need to hear some of the things because they're the ones that have to sit there and understand what they're trying to say to them. So it's my hope that they can hear what the students have to say in order for them to understand that what's been going on for a lot of years might at some point need to change. It doesn't have to change all at the same time, but it just might need to change little by little in order for you know things to move in a, in a different way. So they're trying to do it in a graceful way, but hopefully at some point, you know, they they will listen. So I, I commend you because you're getting it out to your own peers, but you're also getting it out to the people that it really need to to they really need to hear it also mm -hmm. i commend you well said i feel like you all are the angels of anti-racism in concord and just boy thank you for all you're doing and and please do keep us posted on anything we can do to, to support your efforts we, we could not be more supportive yeah, I'd love to just get one last word and i've talked with these guys quite a bit different ones in different settings and it's also positive and I, it's not lost on me that a lot of this has come from pain that you've experienced in our schools. And I can't say enough that the model you're setting is one of peace and grace and positivity and change. And I, I just know you're gonna succeed because I know there's a readiness here too. And hopefully we continue to help you access that readiness because I hear it all the time. Um, but you've you've turned really hard experiences into to something really wonderful. And um, that is not easy for adults. I'm just so impressed with your your ability to do it as kids. And I 
I think student leadership is the way a culture changes. It's it's kids leading each other. Um, I think more than the adults, frankly. So just thank you. We're so grateful. So be safe, take care of each other, and thank you for taking care of CCHS and the middle school um, and continuing continuing the good work. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's an emotional workout, as it should be. Yeah. Dr. And Hunter, I, I thought your your remarks at the conclusion were perfect. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank True. you for that. I've had, you know, it's hard. I've heard some really hard things that were hard to hear. I'm sure hard to say. And um, they're so inspiring that they've turned that pain into something positive in a way that I think is going to matter. Yeah. Um, we're really, really excited. Dr. Hunter, um, was there a program, a body program for, uh, for medical students that could stay in town during the week uh, so they wouldn't have to make that trek back home? It wouldn't work during the COVID time, but uh, right. maybe in the future, Kala might be open to something like this. It, 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 I don't know if I heard correctly at one of those medical presentations. Yeah, we have our friends and family program. Um, Mr. Amici's done a great job of uh, reinvigorating it. It's always been strong at Alcott, I think, as the kids are little, and then it starts to wane a bit. Um, he was, he's been rebuilding the middle school component really actively. Um, so it's a little different in COVID, you're right. <laughs> um, we're still seeing people connect, and uh, there's actually a met co-parent who leads that organization. And here's an exciting piece of news silver linings to to COVID. Um, we've always invited some of those METCO leader, parent leaders to our PTG meeting and the president's meeting. And of course they could never attend. And now with Zoom they can and they are. And what a richer meeting it already is. So we're gonna have to make sure we don't lose track of how we became more accessible out of need and make sure that it sticks out of just because it's it's a good option. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a strong program. Eva, it's needed some rebuilding at the middle school and high school primarily, but Mr. Nimichi's been really working at that. Um, so thank you. There may be yes, there may be some interest once COVID is uh, gone and over with uh, mm -hmm. to to uh, bring some of those students um, to uh, Carlisle and um, build that uh, program in Carlisle. As we are looking for some ways uh, to bring diversity and understanding of um, others, people's journeys and different different journeys, right, from our, from our own. Um, uh, it makes better citizens. It makes much more uh, better thriving kids when they go off to college. I can tell you that, you know, those relationships, these kids from Metco, they, they give so much to the, to the students um, that are in our schools. So I, I hope they, um, they are very proud of, um, the parents are very proud of them because it, it, I was just in awe. Great kids. Yeah. It's hard to move on to anything else. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to say what's the next topic. We can talk about this for hours. <laughs> we, we do have some new business and then oh, well. a little bit of old business. So, um, Dr. Hunter, Jared, do you want to take the lead on the bargaining? Yeah, I think, you know, this is just, sure, Sarah, this is just a placeholder, I think, at the moment. Um, we have we do have eight bargaining units that are, well, we have eight total, seven of them are up this coming six months. So it's just a, you know, public way for us to say we're going to get started in planning and organizing and we'll share out things as we start to build them in terms of timeline and schedule. Um, we have, you know, between Jared and I, we've let the union presidents know that we're gonna start this conversation. It, typical practice is that they invite us through a, a, a demand to bargain, but we're gonna kind of get ahead of that and say we know, and we wanna set a timeline with them. So really just a placeholder tonight, I think. Great. 
Thank you. So, yeah, thank you for putting that together. And uh, we, we know that if we get started now, uh, we can see that everybody gets heard and that we manage this process effectively for yep. uh, a group of uh, employee units that are uh, comprised of outstanding people as we saw tonight. Um, so I think Sarah, we could turn to old business then. Uh, I think we can turn to old business and we have a presentation by Heather to guide us through the uh, evaluation rubric. You're, Okay, sorry about that there. Thank you. Um, yes, happy to guide through. Um, is everybody just gonna, it's on the link. Do you, do you wanna just pull up your own link or do you want me to share something? Okay. So for starters, I'm looking at superintendent evaluation recommendations dated yeah. November 3. Yep, exactly. As long as you follow the link, that's fine. Um, it's the link on the, um, on the agenda. So. Why don't I do this? I figured I would kind of go through a summary of what I've looked at and what I'm recommending in terms of our process. As always, this is my personal recommendation and now it's all for, it's up for all of us to do, discuss and decide how we wanna go about this. Um, what I did is I spent some time with both the original DESE um, evaluation form which was released in 2012, I say original, the, basically the one that's been used for years. So it was released in 2012. And then their revised version, <coughs> which uh, was put out in 2019 as an option for districts to use as part of a pilot. So this was last year. We as a committee at the beginning part of last year decided, sure, let's use that pilot. And then of course, by the time we got to the end of the year and COVID was happening, <clears throat> Sorry, everything kind of went out the window and we used um, a, a more simplified version of the old form just to keep things streamlined and simple during COVID. Um, so we want to return to this and decide for sure what we all want to do now. So what I've done is highlighted the differences um, and there aren't too many. It's really a couple substantive changes. And then my recommendations for both the form use, and then I laid out a potential process for the rest of the year for us to use. So if you're looking at that document, um, that's the context there, which is that it, the revised one was released in 2019. <coughs> Excuse me. The changes, there are really only two substantive changes in the 2019 version. And one of them is the, um, the primary one. So number one, under each performance standard, um, there are many indicators that are used to evaluate each standard. In the 2019 version, there are basically check mark boxes for committees to choose, or committees and the superintendent, to designate some of those as focus indicators. And then you focus on those, you use those specific indicators to evaluate the full standard. Now, all of this might seem like another language still if you haven't spent some time with the form um, because it is a little complicated and confusing. Um, but that kind of narrows the number of things that you're looking at to do your evaluation and lets us focus on the things that we and the superintendent really care about this year instead of looking at lots of different metrics, some of which are not our priorities for the year. <laughs> um, the second one is that there used to be this standalone metric um, called impact on student learning. Um, it, it's, it stood alone with the high level goal evaluation and there was really not much to information to use to decide what was the superintendent's impact on student learning. It kind of just stood there alone. <laughs> so that was taken out. And moved as more of a lens, <laughs> Court knows I like that term, <laughs> under standard one. Um, <clears throat> and this is per DESE regulation. It is no longer considered a standalone metric. It's really under standard one instructional leadership for use as another indicator um, for those that need to ensure that assessment data is being used as a part of the analysis. So those are the two changes. Um, there are a couple other non-standard, just um, the, the kind of the layout of 
um, some of the overall ratings and things like that. So I won't get into the details of that. My recommendation is that we adopt the 2019 form because the two changes that are made make a lot of sense and make it a lot more efficient and I think effective. Um, and second, that following that naturally, you would then, we would use the indicators noted in the superintendent's goals that we voted on last time as the focus indicators to evaluate each standard. Um, so to show that, I did go through, um, and one of the next documents you'll see is the 2019 form, and I've put those in. So we'll get to that. But first, let me just go through kind of a high-level schedule <coughs> um, as a recommendation, and then I can get more into the form itself to, to get a little detail there. So my process recommendation, the October ones, we can already check off. Superintendent proposes goals and associated focus indicators, which she did, and we approved them. So done. Um, this, this month, we need to adopt an evaluation form and then uh, appoint evaluation coordinators to manage the process. So usually we have two people who kind of manage this whole process, um, and you'll see they have more of a role at the end also um, in, in pulling together the, the various uh, evaluations. So ongoing throughout the year, this is really important, uh, Dr. Hunter has been providing us updates in her superintendent reports that link to her goals. And she kind of did this, did this from the beginning, uh, and it's very helpful. And as we saw in her, the last superintendent report that she gave us last time, the, her updates were tied specifically to the goals that she had put out. So by doing this, it means that when we get to the end of the year, we're not all looking for evidence or trying to figure out what she's done on her goals. It's right there in front of us because she's kept us updated on it throughout the year. Uh, so that really streamlines things. Those literally become the record of evidence for the end of cycle evaluation, um, which if anybody used to watch these things, six years ago, we used to get a huge binder of printed evidence. And believe me, you don't want one of those. This is much more efficient. Um, so then next major step from now would be in January when the superintendent will provide us a mid-cycle goal update. And then each of us will have the opportunity to meet with her to discuss that update. Um, no official evaluation or anything at that point. It's just kind of a, a mid-cycle touch point. Um, then we move forward to spring. Um, and for the next items, I really work backwards from June. We want to wrap this up by early June so that we're not scrambling to do it at the end of June as school's out and everything. Uh, in order to do that, we really want to start the process by May, early even May, potentially early to mid-May, asking... Dr. Hunter to give us an end of cycle self-evaluation. She does this every year, so she'll bring us something that shows her goals and, and what she has done related to each one. Again, we each have the opportunity to meet with her to discuss all of that. Then each of us will fill out the evaluation form, which is what we're about to look at. Um, once everybody has submitted one, our two evaluation coordinators will take those, and this is the really fun part, synthesize them into one summative evaluation form. And that is what we then present publicly at a meeting in June. So that's the process that I'm recommending as an outline. I can, I will do a high level going through this form so that everybody has a little bit of a feel for it before we, because it's helpful actually to have a feel for it now before you get into the rest of the year and watching goals and everything. But first, questions or comments so far? Anything? I have a question just about the coordinators synthesizing the individual forms. Yeah. Uh, because I, the MASC talks about a Supreme Court justice case that says that like no school committee member can see all of the um, responses. Once once all the responses are compiled together, it becomes open. It becomes considered deliberation and an open meeting. Um, so. See all of them. See all the like whoever is whoever is whoever's filed, collecting them, right? Would read them all. Right. That becomes considered deliberation. So once all of them have been seen by any member of the school committee, it's considered uh yeah. Huh. That's a good guy. I've never heard that, and this is how we've always done it, and legal has, you know, okay recommended that we do it this way. So Okay. Um, I think Lori, maybe we should double check. We should check in with Michelle and see. If yeah. 
Because in Carlisle, in Carlisle, we get we give to somebody else, not on the school committee, to put them together. Oh, uh, I think it's in the end of. Could we get some, it's what? I think I think it's in the end of the document. It's not. I think it's just um, a misunderstanding. Uh, it becomes public. It doesn't mean that no one can see it. We can, but um, it becomes a public document. Whether the compilation or the individual reports are are public, but um, it does not exclude school committee uh, school committee member to be the coordinator. Um, it's at the end of the, the the document that we are looking at right now. Right. Fatima read the whole guide I sent. I'm amazed because it's really long and deep. <laughs> um, well, and I, so to echo that, I think uh, my guess, again, I'm not a lawyer. My guess is that your read on it is correct. And when we, so typically the way we've done it, when we bring that recommended summative evaluation. Wait, hold on a second. Let me think back. It think is it's on page 13. in public. So it's not like those two people are saying, this is it, no discussion. It is a, you know, it's a public discussion. So that would be our deliberation. But everybody has given their input already. So let's let's double check that. We'll reach out to our council. but. Um, and it, um, it's on page 13 if you want to take a look 13. at it now. Yeah. This is the court determined that the composite evaluation contains the opinion of individual members of the committee. As such, it rises in the court's eyes to the level of deliberation. Therefore, as soon as the composite evaluation is available to the committee members, it must be available to the public. So I don't. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah. So that we do. As soon as we send the composite evaluation, the summative, to all of the members, it can also be posted on the agenda as a public document. So that does, but it doesn't preclude one member of the, any one or two members of the committee from having that information before the others, right? Right, because somebody okay. has to create it. Okay. So no, once it's available yeah. to everyone, so I guess that means we only send it to everyone at the same time that we post it on the agenda and it, okay. and it okay. is public. No, because in Carlisle, we don't, nobody from the committee handles it. it so it's, yeah. So uh, who, some, who summarizes it then? As I recall last year, it was, we thought it was appropriate because it was simply a data compilation. We were just, ag somebody was aggregating the data. It's an admin assistant kind of. An admin does it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Cynthia, does that sound accurate from your okay. recollection that it was, it was a process of aggregating? That's always been the process. Yeah. It was aggregating quantitative data. It wasn't deliberating. So let's just check in on that. Um, I'm just trying to get to, so tonight's goals are for us to sort of up prove in some way the approach in the mm -hmm. yeah basically to to adopt the form that we want to use and to adopt a schedule so i just have a, pr a question not a problem mm -hmm. in terms of aggregating the data um those do we aggregate everything in the um, each of the categories uh, the underlying um, categories with the so the ones with the little blue mark i assume are the ones do we are those weighted more heavily yes so those are the ones that you use so if you look at the form mm -hmm. um you would take into account let's say we choose three indicators under a certain standard as the focus indicators mm -hmm. you would rate on those and you look at those ratings to determine the overall rating for that standard so for just <clears throat> so i'm sure i get it straight so for example, one, I would not even provide a rating for 1A, for 1D, is that correct? Um, right, hold on, I'm getting to it, right, if that's not it. Right, exactly, we would, we would rate 1B, 1C, 1E, and 1F. And whoever's doing the, if you, if you got somebody fill that in, we just throw that data out. Right, you can fill it in if you want for, you know, for that's Lori's good. reference <laughs> when she sees it, but. It, but it will not be used in the okay, good. aggregate summaries. Yep, I got it. Okay. Uh, Heather, I have a question. So I, I looked at the instructions for the 2019. Mm -hmm. 
indicators. So there's like what 20 or 40 indicators for right. They say to use between six to eight and really uh, zoom in and focus those indicators on specific goals. I think we are up to 10. Um, I, uh, so I, I, I know that uh, our superintendent does so much work, it's hard to um, keep her between that um, short list of things that we, we are evaluating. Right. Um, so uh, are we going to settle on uh, which indicators uh, we're, we're going to do? It, you did a nice job plugging that stuff in. Oh, good. Um, yes, I mean, the goal is to settle. We want to know we should adopt tonight which indicators we were going to use. And I defaulted to using the ones that Lori referenced in her goal document, goals document. Um, I'm comfortable. So I guess that question could bounce to Dr. Hunter, to you, or whether you feel like you would want to limit the indicators more and have less there. Um, but then at the same time, if you're doing these, you know, if you're doing all of that and they touch those things anyway, it seems like it's to everybody's benefit to use them all. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, your thoughts? I certainly appreciate why Eva asks. Um, I think if they're aligned with the goals, on my end, I'm fine with all of them being evaluated. I think they kind of would be anyway. Um, that's my initial response. Okay. Why don't I do this? Let me go through the form because I think some of the questions and discussions will kind of come up naturally here or going through it might help. Um, <clears throat> so if you scroll down after the recommendations page, the next one is um, is the form. So. And I'm going to go high level for a second here, especially for anybody who hasn't filled it in before. The way the form is set up is so that as Dr. Hunter reads it, she gets the high level information first. Um, so the, the high level um, basically analysis of whether she you know, met her goals and how she did on each standard. Then the details are underneath. So when you're filling it out, it can even make sense to go and do these second sections of it first, where you're filling out the details, to build up to your overall ratings, which then get put in up front. That, that just for kind of perspective and context on, on how that's looking. So step one, for instance, says, how did she do on you know professional practice goals, which it would be hard to sit here and check it off without looking at what were the professional practice goals and what did you do on them? And so that you get down to the, um, the steps below. So steps one, two, and three are very high levels. Two is the, the four standards, which again, the indicators below are gonna lead up to that. And three is the biggest one, it's the overall summative performance. Um, and so numbers one and two feed into that one. Um, so as you can tell, these are the two different parts are her goals and then standards. Goals obviously are the ones that we've discussed that she brought to us and we have adopted. And standards are, are these kind of general leadership qualities. So another thing to discuss here is which is our focus more. You know, we, um, for instance, back when it was, you know, when COVID was just happening, it was all craziness. We debated, should we focus on just goals and not as much the standards because it's the goals that, you know, versus standards uh, in a time like that. So the goals, we're going to skip down to page, after the comment area, it doesn't really have page numbers here, page three of eight. Um, this is where I put in the goals that Dr. Hunter presented to us. So there are, and with a placeholder, we talked about her adding one for reopening schools. Uh, which she did, but so that'll go in there as a student learning goal. Then the two student learning goals that she had, um, the two professional practice goals, and the two district improvement goals. So this page right here is a big part of what we do um, in the evaluation, because this is what we've asked her to focus on all year. So this is really important here. Um, then after that, and there, there was one comment, I think, can, um, I just, uh, can I make a comment about that? Yes, exactly. I was about the goals, I I would personally very much welcome a space in the goals area that just is a space for uh, school committee comments and analysis. 
Um, because as you mentioned, this is the meat of, of, of what Dr. Hunter does, right? Yeah, exactly. The technical stuff is great, right? We do, we have to, per DESI rule, per everything, we have to address all of that. But really, especially right now, I think we want to capture whatever we can of feedback of, um, of just recording how the, how Dr. Hunter, how the school, how, ev how everybody's adapted during this time and been able to achieve these goals yes. through this through this crisis. Yeah. I think that's a great suggestion. Um, as you'll see, there are comment sections throughout the, mm -hmm. the rest of it, just reference here. One is the page before it, which is um, which is right below the overall summative performance. So that's a that's the highest level, you know, overall, how did she do? And so there's space for comments there. But then there are spaces for comments specifically under each standard. And so therefore, to your point, Sarah, I think it would make a lot of sense to add a section here that's comments specifically for the goals. So I would take that as a to-do and add that, unless anybody else has thoughts to the contrary. Uh, I'm in accord. I think it makes sense. Okay. All right. So we'll add that in. I think that makes it. Does that then, Dr. Hunter, does that <laughs> feel good to you? Yeah, no, that it's logical. Okay, great. Um, so then you'll see after that, we get into the standards. There's this little bar under that that just kind of just that shows what the four standards are and the indicators under them. And then there's a page for each standard. There's standard one, which is instructional leadership, and it, all of the indicators below it. I'm obviously not going to read through them all. Um, standard two, which is management operations and all the indicators. Standard three, which is family and community engagement. And then standard four, professional culture. So again, these are the, <coughs> the leadership standards defined by DESE. Um, and the indicators, as noted by Laurie and her goals. So for each of these, in terms of defining how she did, there is a rubric also attached to this after this one, I think, that, that gives examples of what proficient, what exceptional, et cetera, all of these mean um, with regards to each particular indicator. So as you are going through it, if you're not sure what you want to rate on one of these, that's where you use the rubric to figure out um, what those levels are. You'll also see the last thing attached here after the rubric is kind of a high level cheat sheet on those, just so that it, it just summarizes them a little more clearly. Um, so that's the basic, and, and again, there's space for comments under each one. So that's the basic form. You basically evaluate the goals, and we will add a space for comments. Then you evaluate the standards, which we'll do by using the focus indicators. And then you take all of that and build it up to your overall evaluation back up on page two. Um, that's the basic. The next thing attached here is the 2012 version of the form, which is just for reference for comparison purposes in case anybody wanted to see it. And then there's the rubric and the, um, the quick definitions of evaluation metrics. So that's what we have. Heather, um, I, forgive me, I, I missed one thing. Can you explain again the significance of the blue arrows? Yes, so that's where in this 2019 form, <clears throat> um, they're saying that we can specify which indicators are focus indicators. And those are the ones that we will use to evaluate the standard under which they fall. And in Lori's goals, she has indicated, she's noted the indicators um, that are relevant to each of her goals. So I took those and the blue arrows show the indicators that she will be focused on through her goals. Got it. So you put them there consistent with what she told us. Exactly. So I didn't just choose them randomly. I put them there based on the goals. And in fact, if you look at page three of this form where I pasted in all of her goals, it it shows what the, it says there, the focus right. indicators, because gotcha. she's the inner goals, right? So right. they're Thank listed you. there, and then the blue arrows show them under there, because it says check if yes, but the box wasn't checkable, so. All right. Thank <laughs> you for going through that again. Instead. Heather, there is a, a rubric below um, 
uh, the standards uh, was stating the number of goals and uh, space for the description and comments. Uh, are, uh, would we be able to maybe add the goals in there? Should we be following, um, should we uh, be looking at this form mid, uh, mid year to sort of see where we are and uh, uh, jotting, jotting down, putting down some, some of the information coming back from the superintendent? What, what are your thoughts? Mid year, uh, my take, and this is just my personal recommendation, is that it could be up to you. If it helps you to organize your thoughts, then sure, by all means, take a look at it. But we are not filling out forms mid-year. We're not presenting an evaluation. We're not using this form formally at all mid-year. Um, you know, if it helps you to look at it as you have a discussion with Dr. Hunter so that you can understand the progress towards the end of your goals, by all means, use it as a tool and look at it. But we won't be formally using it. And those descriptions, unless something really, really changes, those descriptions that, that Heather's put in here are Lori's goals. So that's that's going to stay as right. it is. The, that's not space goals. for us to add something. That's why we're going to add a little space uh, space at the bottom where people can reflect upon all of the goals. Or, or focus, exactly. focus on whichever goals you want to focus and call attention to for for, for whatever. Right, exactly. So and we're in not that space, you know, depend on any of them, but encouraged to comment on something about about okay. them. but you don't have but you don't have to come on all of them right exactly there's no expectation of that yeah um other questions or comments well, dr I mean, hunter anything on here that you i mean obviously you've seen it but are you comfortable with this whole form and process as a recommendation yeah, no, I think it feels positive to have this conversation now. I think we tried to have it later in the year, and it seems to do it early makes a lot of sense. It does. And I think this just helps for us all to be on the same page as, as yeah. we start the year and we're, we're watching things all year. Right. Um, yeah, to me, same page means uh, no surprises. Yeah. Dr. Hunter knows uh, the, the, the lens. The lens. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's one of our underlying commitments. So we want to always plan for that. So thank you for doing this, Heather. Sure, no problem. Um, so the thing, if I think what we want to establish tonight is make sure that we are agreeing on all of this. So <laughs> is there general, not that we have to take a vote. Actually, do we, I don't think we have to take a vote, but are we agreeing that we'll adopt the 2019 form as our form? Um, if there's general nods, then, okay, great. We'll adopt yes. that. Um, are we agreeing that we'll use the focus indicators as the lenses for evaluating each standard? Yes. The ones noted by Dr. Hunter. Okay, so that's I like it. Then, and then the next thing is we need to establish two evaluation coordinators. Um, I am happy to take on that role as one of them if <laughs> everybody wants me to. Um, I think there should also be one other person at least, and I don't have to if two other people really want to, um, but I think there should also be somebody else at least who will be on longer term who can plan to kind of do it this year and continue for a year or two so that there's some continuity. <laughs> um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is a, a beginner question and uh, um, That's maybe. what we're here for. <laughs> you can help me understand in comparison between the, the 2019 and the 2012 um, rubrics. Um, the uh, student learning goals and um, how is it being measured? Um, and again, comparing the, the 2012 and the 2019, how are they different? And um, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that the 2019 is uh, uh, meant to be more accurate. Um, so how do we assess the, uh, the student learning, specifically this year with all the challenges, the added challenges? Um, I, I, I wonder if uh, either um, Heather or Dr. Hunter can um, talk to us about that. Um, so I'll jump in first, unless you want my initial take, and then I'll let Dr. Hunter give, she can probably give better details than I do. But um, my initial answer would be, 
um, it, it really all comes back to her goals that she's given us. And then if you look on her, I mean, I've only input in here the high level goals. If we look back at her goal document, she has very specific actions under those. And so in evaluating the goals, that's what we'll be looking at is, is the actions. So on this form, obviously, when you're looking up top at the, at the first page, when it just says, you know, student learning goals everywhere from did not meet to exceeded, right? You, you really have to look down at, okay, what were the student learning goals? We have three of them here. What were the actions entailed in all of those? And look at whether those actions were met. And then those evaluations kind of lead up to the overall student goal evaluation. Does that help? Am I answering the question? So in terms of what we use, yes, it's a weird year, um, but we're not just going to all of a sudden look at some, you know, random test scores that we haven't established at the beginning. We're going to look at the actions that we've established now to define them. Laurie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that's the right that's the right overview. I think um, the goals aren't measurable this year, partly because they had to be so broad because COVID is impacting everything, right. um, and that. I think is a better representation of the work that I'm actually doing because to pick a, a one assessment measure and say we're going to improve by a certain percentage that's the old kind of measurable goal I'm used to seeing and it just didn't fit this year not not that I'm sure that's ever the right exact fit for us either um, so what I think will be the way you're going to assess is um, there will be data certainly provided to you, whether it's the uh, formative screeners we're doing now or the number of students in different special education settings, there definitely will be data to contribute to it. But there's also going to be more qualitative evidence-based pieces, which I think could be found in the curriculum, um, curriculum map work that we're doing, where we're gathering what teachers are covering, where they're teaching. This is our new phrase. We're going to keep saying it that we're not teaching everything, but we're teaching the important things because the pace is different this year. It, it has to be, but we are going to cover all of the important things. So we want to, I want to bring you what that looks like. So I, th I think it'll be a combination of quantitative and qualitative, but it's not quite the same measurable goal as perhaps other SMART goals have been. It just didn't feel the right fit this year. And we've said that to the teachers too, a um, little broader more flexible, bigger picture view of what we're all trying to accomplish here. Throughout the system. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Other questions? And that's a great question. This is the time, I, I will say, I, I mean, I remember my first year doing this, we got to May or something or June and I looked at the form and went, huh, what do I do with this? How do I use it? And how does it relate to these goals we talked about? It didn't seem to relate at all. So the point is to do this and ask those questions now so that you have a good feel for it throughout the year, not just figure it out at the end. And this isn't the last chance to ask questions. Absolutely. No, and I, I just want to encourage that because I mm -hmm. think there's been some times over my years that a single member or two, they, you know, they had felt they didn't get information that they needed and it wasn't information I knew they wanted. So I think maybe there's just this iterative piece I'd really like to encourage with all of you that as we're making our way through, by all means, say, boy, Laura, if you could just bring us this, that would help fill in something I haven't seen yet in that goal. Because I try to I try to bring you what I think fills it in, but that doesn't mean it does fill in everything for you. So let's make this a an ongoing iterative conversation, yeah. either, either as a committee or as individuals. You did not say this is the last time to ask questions, did you? That was, OK. Oh, it, it's that this is not the last time. Not at all. <laughs> Just making sure. Um, Good. In fact, as we get closer, whoops. Okay. Um, no, I was just going to say, as we get into the spring piece of it, I would typically review more also the, the high level um, rubric measures, basically the cheat sheet. In fact, while we're on it, if you just scroll to the very last page of what's attached to the agenda, um, it's the cheat sheet on performance against standards. Now, this is only the standards, not the um, the goals were you know met and exceeded, et cetera. Um, but for standards, this is important because we've had years in the past where different members thought of things differently. You know, one said 
oh, needs improvement means, ah, it's great. Everything can improve. It's pretty good, but let's, you know, there's always room for improvement. And others thought, oh, that's a, that's a red flag. Um, and so we want to all be on the same page in terms of how we're looking for things. And this is a really good overview of that, that proficient is understood to be fully satisfactory. And that's almost the default of what is expected. Um, and it's demanding, but attainable. And that's, that's kind of what everybody strives for is, is proficient in every area, right? An exemplary is above and beyond that. And so it's even a little bit higher than expected, right? Needs improvement represents something that is below what we were actually looking for, um, you know, it, it, where improvement is needed in some way. It means let's have another conversation about something that's going on, right? And unsatisfactory, obviously, even more than that. So it, those are important too, so that we're all looking at things the same way as we rate. And we can certainly touch on these again later as we get to the spring and you're really using the form, we will have more discussion over this. And I'm happy to work with people and answer questions at any time. So I guess the last question, and, and if we don't have somebody who, if everybody wants to think about it more, you can, um, in terms of who would, who would want to work. <laughs> Since we didn't have lots of hands vying for it, I'll assume that I'm doing <laughs> one of the evaluation coordinators. Who would want to work with me on it? And let me go back and clarify what is unless you think that's not useful. What's that? I said I'd be willing to do it just to learn, but if like it's not useful to have someone super new, then tell me to buzz off. But no, I actually think that would be great because it's good to do it with somebody who's who's done it before so that you can kind of learn and then okay. next year you're the experienced one. If you're willing to do it, that's great. <laughs> I, I'll do it. Okay, great. That's true. Okay. And basically, we'll just kind of manage the process throughout the year. There isn't that much to do between now and May, right. other than we'll, you know, make sure that they get us on the agenda in January to do a mid-cycle right. review. Um, and then come May, there's a little more work. We have to make sure everybody turns in their forms. And then the biggest piece is really once everybody's turned them in, creating that summative evaluation. Um, so that'll be great. Okay, so we've adopted our form and process and we now to have two coordinators um and i think that was the goal for tonight unless there are other questions or comments it's like i just wanted to add heather it's a very good exercise to go through the evaluation once um i i i have one more year to go so i don't think i would be that that helpful um, but it's an excellent um, exercise, and the new form is much better than the 2012. Yeah, it's much easier to navigate for for everybody to even uh, collect information that um, from members. Um, it's much more precise, so it will be an easier <laughs> process this year. Yes, we'll thank you for started. stepping. Up. Definitely, thanks, Emma. I have a quick question. Do you think we're going to go much longer? I had a, I have a meeting that started at 7.30 that I told them I was coming on at 8, but I just want to know if I need to push them back anymore. Well, we have... Yeah. Ten of eight. We have variance reports and policies and a couple of votes. Uh, I would guess we're... Let's see, approval, school committee goals. I would guess we're another... 20, maybe 30 minutes, 20, 30. Yeah. Okay. Should we aim for 815 and see if we can do it in 2020? <laughs> so that, are we, I'm just jumping in quarter, Sarah, you can. Yeah, I, let's just, let's press on. Uh, we, we know Jared was here for purposes of the variance report, so. <laughs> We, we don't want to. Uh, yes, let's let him do that. We don't want to tell him to come back next time. And I think the votes are going to move quickly. So when yeah. we move to the variance report, uh, the policies we've studied and even extended, that might go quickly. Yep. Yeah, we, we could be done in 15 if we're I, we, Let's be optimistic. Go. Jared, Jared, if you'd be so kind. Yes, uh, I only need 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> so. Just starting with CPS, uh, as you can see, we're in balance. Um, we do have, you do see a negative in the 900s. 
reason for that right now is we did have some new are you can you share your yeah you need to oh. screen share sorry about that we do have the link but and this is an updated uh, spreadsheet from the October 27 one. Correct. So this is as of uh, uh, last week. Okay. Um, let's see. Is, can you see that? Yeah, thank you. Right. Okay. Um, so here is the CPS um, variance report, the monthly report. So you'll get one more after this of the monthly, and then we'll go to the the, uh, the the 100s, but we are in balance. Uh, you, we do have a negative right here. The reason for that is, is we're gonna be moving that money to uh, the 240 grant, which is a special ed uh, IDEA. <clears throat> I like to wait till the money's in before moving that. So that will slowly, um, that will go to zero eventually. We are encumbering as much as we can at the moment. Um, but we are in pretty good shape. It didn't move much since I last gave it to you three weeks ago or two weeks ago, but um, we're trending well. Good. Uh, and the high school variance report, same thing. Um, the only right now um, negative here is in the programs of the districts. We will be moving that also to the IDEA we are in balance. This is this will go down significantly once we encumber all of the debt and everything. This is something we do around this time. Uh, I, I will have that probably by the next meeting. Uh, with the end of year report and a few other things, Ian is a little preoccup uh, preoccupied, but he does do that. Ian Rames, the assistant business manager. Um, so, uh, help me with IDEA. Do you move enough over to cancel out the deficit? Uh, between that and circuit breaker. So in the budget every single year, I have an offset uh, for both circuit breaker and IDEA. And the reason I have an offset is because I want to show what the real tuitions amount uh, are um, instead of having the full tuition amount and then you know, reducing it by what we think circuit breaker and IDEA will come in. Both perfectly acceptable, but I feel like this is, um, it's more transparent um, and it's easier to explain. Um, so. And then you move it out against uh, those funds much later. Yeah, so what we do is we just, uh, we charge the revolving accounts mm -hmm. or the grant account. So instead of charging what we call the 100s, we, we would show the 200s. We would charge the, um, the if in the warrants the the difference like the one two sevens and the one two threes uh, the beginning values and I'll explain all of this actually on December eighth when I go over um, chart of accounts so you'll get a little history and tutorial on that. You're just warming us up. I'm just warming you up. You know, I think these show, as we've gone a few months into the year, that um, rebuilding those budgets was worth all of the work and stress that it cost, because um, we're we're doing well and staying on track with what we planned. So that's okay. all good news. Good. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. Any comments. He's always going to be here. You know, you can explain that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have a friend in Lori. Don't Nobody you? has to keep me company. <laughs> <laughs> the moral support. <laughs> You're not <laughs> enjoyable. <laughs> Just in case <laughs> something comes up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? No. We can move on to court to policy. So here we have pulled out two policies that we looked at uh, prior. Uh, one discipline with some changes that were proposed by Court David and Yuval last winter. Um, uh, discipline was one, bullying was one. Uh, they're in the hands of our attorney right now. So Lori's going to bring us up to date on that at a future meeting. So that leaves the one, two, three, six that are here. Um, we can go through them again if you wish. Um, I don't know what the will of the committee is. 
I'm happy we looked at them last time. Okay. Unless somebody has it needs to discuss it, then yeah. Unless there's a if there are questions, people should speak up. I need to open up because after we discuss it, uh, I expect we'll have a, a single motion for the adoption of all of these called out by by letter. So, okay. Sarah, I think we're satisfied. I think so. I think we can move on to that actionable item right now and the other two. Okay. So I'll hit a link here and uh, I'll move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the following school committee policies. File BDFA-E-3, Conduct of School Council Business. File ECAF, uh, Security Cameras in Schools. Uh, and file JIB, student involvement in decision making, file JICA, student dress code, file JICF, gang activity, secret societies, and JIE, pregnant students. A second. Second for both committees. Anderson, I for both. And Booth, I for both. About I for both. May set, I for both. Eva? I for most, uh, Mustafi, I for region. Sorry, my internet hung up. I for both. And Wilson, I for region. Thank you. Um, and then we have a vote to approve the 2020-2021 school committee goals as discussed in previous meetings. I, I, I'll move for both committees that the Congress School Committee and Congress Carlisle Regional School Committee adopt these school committee goals for 2020-2021 uh, as posted and as discussed at our last two meetings. Second for both. Anderson, I for both. And thank you for doing this, uh, putting this together and shepherding it through. Booth, I for both. Out, I for both. Ms. Dutt, I for both. Mustafi, I for region, and thank you again. Reading, I for both. Wilson, I for region. Thank you all. And lastly, there a motion to vote to accept the wonderful CEF donation. We um, are. Before you move it, I think we're going to have you make it a joint motion because there are some of the uh, workstations are going to the high school. Oh, they are? Two, two of them are, I think. Yeah. Okay. So make then it. I'll move that the Concord School Committee and Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee vote to accept the donation of $16,348.82 from the Concord Ed Fund for the purchase of new bike stands and repair stations. Second. For both. For both. Thank you. Alexa. Oh, sorry, nuts. The meeting people. Anderson, I for both. <laughs> and, uh, both You're uh, almost there. I for both. About I for both. Ms. Dan, I for both. Mustafi for region. Randy, I for both. Wilson, I for region. And uh, lastly, is there a motion to adjourn? Our open session at 7:59 p.m. <laughs> you were inspiring, Alexa. <laughs> see, <laughs> I'll move that we adjourn before 8 p.m. <laughs> Second that. <Matt. laughs> Roll call. Anderson, I for both. <laughs> I for both. About I for both. Face dad, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Randy, I for both. And Wilson, I for region. Bye. Thank you all, everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Thanks, everyone.